Hey everybody, this is Nick. I hope you're all doing alright today. Uh, I just wanted to weigh in a little bit on the anniversary of the Sega Dreamcast North American launch, uh, which was this day 21 years ago, 9999. Man, I remember the launch really well because at the time uh, I was a big Sega fan and I had the Sega Genesis and the Sega 32X and um, we had skipped over the Sega Saturn at the time just because it had come out so close to the 32X and we had settled on that uh, as a family you know it was a, a, the big family purchase at the time and actually also I was really big in the PC gaming as well um, for, for since I was really young so I always had that to balance out my my gaming as well but so that was really fun you know uh, the anticipation leading up to the Sega Dreamcast launch. Uh, I remember uh, having a subscription, I believe, to Next Gen Magazine, and they had some of the coolest screenshots, you know, of all of the greatest games that were uh, coming out at the time, and all the games that came out in uh, the Japanese launch or earlier uh, uh, the year before. So that was really cool to see uh, the launch crowds and everything like that. Uh, but yeah, launch was just such a fun time because uh, because it was just a, such a marketing hit. Uh, they really hit every single stride that they could. You know, they were uh, internet focused and multiplayer focused. You know, N64 and PlayStation were out at the time, of course, and they were heavy hitters. Uh, PlayStation especially so. I mean, N64 was too, but... Um, I believe the games are a little bit more money than the uh, than the PlayStation, just because uh, they were obviously still on cartridges, and it was Nintendo was was kind of like the old old hat, you know, premium product at the time, and Sony was kind of the the new untested. But anyways, uh, yeah, Sega was kind of like they were throwing everything at it, and the North American launch was really exciting. I believe we got ours from. I believe Babbage's that was in our local mall uh, that used to, I know Babbage's used to sell a lot of PC software. That's where I had my pre-order for, uh, I believe for Half-Life um, and Half-Life 2 subsequently when that came out. It was a big, big, big uh, uh, local chain for that. But anyways, I'm going to jump in a little bit to the uh, what I thought made it special. Uh, the whole launch experience was awesome because because the system was so cheap at the time. You know, 199 was just a bargain. It was such a great great deal. You know, it was a very easy sell for uh, I know my parents, but uh, we we're able to you know get a few launch titles and I think all of them at the uh, the time I wasn't I'm not really big into sports games or anything, but uh, so I didn't really get any of those until later on, but. Just want to jump into a couple that that I got that I I still have. There's a couple that I had traded in a while back that I still have to get back, and I didn't realize it until I was making this video that I actually had traded them in, and I was like, I I thought I had those games, but I guess not anymore. But anyways, um, one of my first favorite ones, classic uh, Sonic Adventure. Uh, Sonic Adventure just it blew my mind uh, with with everything that generation when it came out. The, just the amazing opening soundtrack. The graphics were still like I hadn't played PlayStation. I hadn't, you know, I was just used to, you know, 1998, 1999 PC graphics, which were great at the time with uh, 3D accelerators coming out and really wowing us. But on a console experience, a living room experience, because that was a thing, you know, you had living room experiences and PCs weren't really part of that. Uh, those were at a desk or in a, in a computer room or, you know, something like that. So the living room experience, you know, was was really important. And everybody gathered around the living room. Like, obviously, you know, they still do now, but to a different degree. Um, but yeah, I mean, just Sonic Adventure was such a great, you know, it, it was a great test for the, the sound system <laughs> and being able to, to play. And, and I love... Um, you know the artwork was great, and obviously the ads for uh, Sega Bass Fishing with the um, the Sega the the, um, the controller that they had for that. 
Um, but it also had modem capabilities on the back. So there was some downloadable content like Christmas special, Halloween special stuff uh, that uh, suited up Station Square a little bit in the game. So kind of made it really fun and, and just made you feel like you were part of a of a future experience, you know, something that nobody had really had before uh, in their living room. So that was really cool. Another one that I I was never really big into fighting games. Um, I really just wasn't, you know, there wasn't anything. I, I wasn't really um, able to go to arcades at you know, at the time until until shortly after that. So I was a very late arcade blo uh, bloomer. Um, but Soul Calibur. Soul Calibur was amazing. Again, for the intro, the graphics were beautiful. Like, by the time I got to see it in the arcades, I was like, man, this actually looks better than the arcade version. So, um, very, very powerful, easy to get into, very easy to, um, to, you know, to really just level up and, uh, not really level up, but they had a great, um, a lot of incentives. You can unlock characters and, it was just so fun, you know. There's a lot of cheap hits, of course, but uh, so I've got the the North American version here. <clears throat> I also have the the Japanese version here. I I got it at a, a local store. It was very um, it was very <laughs> uh, reasonable at the time. It, um, there's actually whoops hit hit the mic. Uh, it says n uh, no resale, so it must have been either packed in or uh, part of a bundle. But just love the artwork. Yeah, I just absolutely love the artwork of um of a lot of the games and so yeah soul caliber um one thing too that at the time was kind of funny um was that uh, if you're you're obviously if you're watching this you're probably uh, you you know the intro of soul caliber well you know it really uh <laughs> it's it's pretty cool it's pretty dynamic you know pretty neat music and everything like that but I remember uh, locally, we'd go to a computer show every every you know month, every couple weekends. They'd have it at the local college, and what a computer show really was was before people could really buy computer parts online readily and and cheaply. Um, the best way to go would you know to to build your own machines or to get software um, or to go to these local organized basically like vendor run computer fairs where they take like an indoor uh, basketball stadium indoor basketball court and have just you pay like two or three dollars to get in and uh, they'd have just tables and tables and tables of vendors that you can buy stuff on I know they still run them a lot of them have kind of tweaked their their um, uh, their selling motive like they have like they have other stuff you know that you can buy um, some of them have pirated software uh, that you can buy even back then I mean you get shareware uh, and it was pretty easy to copy copy disks but anyways I'm getting off point here um, they would sell uh, computer parts computer monitors were also you know a big selling point and they always uh, after this game came out after Soul Calibur came out um, because uh, Dreamcast was VGA uh, compatible, which was really great. Well, they could just hook up a bunch of monitors to a Dreamcast and show the, the color fidelity and the graphical fidelity uh, of the Dreamcast, but to sell their monitors. So for probably a year or two, at least, easily, after Soul Calibur came out on the Dreamcast, they would just have set up the Dreamcast, Daisy Chain, the, the VGA, uh, monitors uh, to the Dreamcast to show the color and show off the beauty of the the monitors at the time. Really funny. <laughs> um, another arcade hit. Um, it's not the cleanest copy, but oh man, this was really fun. Hydro Thunder, uh, another launch title that I got, and I'm not sure why it, it is hot new. Well, I mean, it it was a launch title. It was new. At, uh, I know there was a couple other home ports for it. Um, but no, it was really fun. You know, uh, uh, another classic Midway arcade game brought home. You got, you know, some of these games had the, uh, they even tell you like the Jump Pack compatible, which, you know, Jump Pack was, was pretty popular on the Dreamcast and uh, and the N64 had the, the Rumble Pack um, just for force feedback. Pretty cool stuff. But um, 
that was the first time I actually really played a system that had that feature. So for me, it was really, it was really cool to have, you know, this, this kind of like edgy arcade game. I mean, it was E for everybody, but I mean, it was pretty neat, you know, loud and in your face. You know, another one was a uh, trick style. So this one was kind of a weird one. I'm kind of mixed on it. When I first got it, you know, it was launch title. It was one of the games that you got and you know you know kids from that generation like you got a game you played it you know even if it wasn't the best game uh you still try to get your worth out of it now um i haven't played this game in quite a few years so my my um perception of it might change when i try it again but uh i you know it was cool kind of cool they give you a training arena it was basically hoverboard racing um, pretty unique at the time, you know, big chunky characters kind of look like, uh, Quake 3 arena type characters, just the way the polygons were, um, a lot of stunts, you know, it was one of those, <clears throat> those, those trying to be futuristic racing games at the time, um, pretty fun stuff, but yeah, I, I liked it, but it wasn't, it wasn't my favorite, I mean, it didn't have the lasting appeal of some of the other games that I just showed you. A um, couple of the games uh, that I played uh, around launch time, Power Stone was another launch game that I absolutely loved. Uh, such a great game. I have Power Stone 2. I don't believe I still have Power Stone 1. But that was kind of, I don't want to say the <laughs> the answer to uh, Super Smash Brothers, but it was like one of those multi-tiered 3D beat em up type of fighter games um, that was pretty unique at the time. Power Stone 2 is still one of my favorite uh, beat em up games uh, of all time and for good reason. You know, they really expanded the, the levels and uh, just it was so fun. First one is still amazing and uh, yeah, it's just it's just amazing. I know they, they did a PSP port um, of both of those. I don't know. I don't remember off right off hand um, where else Power Stone came out on after that but they definitely didn't make a third one if they haven't or made it already um one other one that i played at launch and i regret that i don't have it even though it, it wasn't my favorite game i don't remember again i probably traded in probably like four or five years after i got it but ready to rumble boxing man that was a a, a pretty unique boxing game i know my 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 parents picked it up and like oh this might seem fun i'm like i'm not in the sports games but it was funny you had the unique characters you had the unique boxers that had their own uh power-ups and moves and uh they had a couple unlockable characters ready to rumble round two was later but that was really fun too i believe michael jackson was an unlockable boxer <laughs> um but yeah it was just a funny game um really fun family <laughs> just like you know, like like a like a, a, a just a fun Friday night game that you just pop in and and just <laughs> just beat each other up on. But man, so the Dreamcast, you know, it was so much fun. I got so much gameplay hour out of it. Um, I really, you know, I started growing my collection after that, and that was around the time I really started. Uh, getting uh, into video game collecting uh, in the back you might, might see some uh, uh, Sega Genesis games uh, I started really collecting with the Genesis those are the games I started keeping um, but the dream like right around the Dreamcast time um, I started getting my passion for game collecting you know a lot of game systems were just being thrown out getting cheaper especially when ps2 came out and gamecube and 64's original playstation saturn they were all just like being thrown out everybody couldn't get rid of them fast enough um so i know dreamcast kind of really got me back into uh the the console gaming uh, world uh, because i had been out of it for a, a couple years <clears throat> after the 32x came out so um yeah that was Dreamcast was, had a great launch, and it's been 21 years since it came out, man. That is, time flies. Time really does fly, but uh, some games haven't aged 
super well. I'm looking at you, Sonic Adventure. I know a lot of people love it. I love it. It's, I mean, I will play the original version over the GameCube version any day, to be honest with you. Steam version's probably a little bit better because you can mod it and get 16 by 9 support and, you know, but still, you know, the original characters, um, the, the multiple storylines, the online play, the Chow Garden. Um, I'd probably say my beyond that, the only thing I wanted to really talk about was my favorite experiences on Dreamcast. I'd have to say a couple of them would be Shenmue launch. I remember my sister and I, you know, we, we pre-ordered the game, got the strategy guide, and just, it was, that, that game just blew my mind when it came out about the, the graphical power, the, you know, the, they, uh, they, they basically, Yu Suzuki sold it as uh, a new genre of video games, you know, f the free, F-R-E-E, -E. I think it was something like full reactive eyes entertainment genre of game where you could basically, you know, go anywhere and, and you know, you they had a little bit of fighting and, well, you all know about Shenmue. I'm, I'm speaking to the choir here. But uh, Shenmue absolutely blew my mind and uh, kind of changed my perception of how video game storytelling could be. And uh, Fantasy Star Online. So I had been online for a few years before that, you know, on, on PC. And that was a whole brand new world. Um, but Fantasy Star Online, the way that they... Uh, really solved a lot of international language barrier problems using emotes and using quick uh, button gestures and you know phrase pre-built in phrases that uh, were already translated to different regions that and the fact that they sold you know a keyboard that's that's kind of hard to find anymore um, that I that I I absolutely got one it came out because I, I wanted to, to chat with people uh, on Fantasy Star Online. But, man, Fantasy Star Online kind of changed the way I, I, I gamed online at the time. I spent up, you know, spent a lot of time uh, playing that game. And I remember when uh, there was a lot of Game Shark uh, hackers on there. And there was, <laughs> there was no hacking protection, barely. So, there, you know, some of the exploits would be like if you had a level 100 character and then somebody would join the game uh, with like a level 3 character and they could actually use cheats to uh, kick you off the server swap the character route so your character save would be the level 2 or 3 character that they had in there and it would re re restart the um, the console doing an auto save to your VMU so it would overwrite your game save that was such a bad, a bad hack that you know a lot of I, I've seen a few people uh, lose characters too. But I remember um, that we started a, a, a few of us started a, a um, an anti-hacking clan. Where it was kind of funny where we'd we'd kind of use hacks in our own way to to boot hackers off the off the main server when we found them to try to you know clean up around there because it was just a bad experience after the hackers went on there but I mean bad relatively like I had so much fun doing it but for casual players it was just it started to become a bad experience until they started doing the Hunter's Guild licensing for I think version 2 and uh, other versions of the game but anyways yeah Dreamcast 21 years ago North American launch of course it came out earlier in Japan and other regions but that is the day I would never forget and it changed my um, my view on gaming quite a bit, and my view on storytelling and art, and even music, actually. Um, Genesis had a, a really big impact on my music taste, but Dreamcast just, mm, it kind of blew, blew my perception out of the water for that. But, well, I really do appreciate you uh, hanging around and listening to me talk about Dreamcast turning 21 uh, years old in North America, and... Uh, thank you so much, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care.